a big thank you to all my patrons who support the Engineered Mind podcast. Hi and welcome to the Engineered Mind podcast. In this podcast, we cover topics such as engineering, artificial intelligence, neuroscience, and other interesting topics to educate, inspire, and engineer people's minds all around the world. I'm your host, Yosef, and for this episode of the podcast, I'm very excited to have Tobias Holzmann on my show. Tobias is a CFD engineer, open form enthusiast, and well known in the open form community by contributing an enormous amount of material as well as knowledge to the world. His website provides helpful content concerning open form. He offers free available training videos, screencasts, cases, publications, developments, and extensions, as well as many fun simulations are ready to use and watch for people all over the world. Tobias tries to keep the level of simulations for his customers at a decent and sustainable level. He has a personal credo not to manipulate any numerical data, plots, or any other things related to the computational fluid dynamics area within a fair price. In this podcast, we talked about, of course, open form, where his passion for open form comes from, the open form community, how much work Tobias spends on his projects, what his PhD thesis was about, his new 3D printer project, and a lot more interesting things about him as a person. For updates on upcoming podcasts, projects, and videos, make sure to follow me on Twitter as well as on Instagram. To join my weekly newsletter, ingenitemind.sh, where I share exclusive content. Visit yusuf.substack.com. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's my podcast with Tobias Holzmann. Tobias, welcome to my show. It's really a pleasure to finally have you on the podcast, which was such a struggle to get you on the show. Um, to get to kick things off, give us like a one or two minute bio. Who is Toby? I know a lot of people already know who you are, but maybe explain the audience who is Tobias Holzmann, what does he actually do? And yeah. Yeah, Yosef, uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you to be in your show today. As you said already, it was a, <laughs> a bit a pain in the ass to get me here in front of the camera, but finally we managed it. Um, two minutes of myself. So my name is Toby. Um, uh, let's, let's keep it very compressed. I'm born 1988, so I'm 32 right now. Um, I'm an environmental and process engineer. So I was studying in Augsburg, my bachelor and my master thesis I made here in Augsburg. And I'm still, now I'm living in Augsburg. Um, and during the study, I get a passion for open form. So I guess uh, most people know me from the open form community. Uh, right now, I am in a small company who's doing CFT simulation in, yeah, in the medicine area. So clean room sinks and, and, and something like that. And yeah, so that's now my study is, uh, was uh, prior. And in between, I made my PhD in Austria and Leoben. Um, I, I wanted to do that because I wanted to go into the field of CFD and I, I, I knew that during that time. So five years ago, I was a fresh man and my skills were not as much as today. And I thought I have to do a PhD, not that I get a doctor degree, more that I have four years more to, to really go into the, the things I want to do. Mm -hmm. Yes. And just for the people who are interested, I was working two years at the MIN. So these big engines, so I was in the sector, sector of uh, power plants. I was responsible for these huge catalyst reactors for the exhaust gas cleaning. So involving everything, the mixing pipe, the reactor itself, the urea distribution system, so storage system, pumping system, and I was responsible for that. Mm -hmm. Yes. This is so that's like a short story about myself. Yeah, this is awesome. We will talk about what you did in your PhD in a few seconds, Toby. Um, yeah. Can you... Let us know where does the passion of open form come from? Because when we talked prior to the podcast or when we first yes. met, you uh, you told an anecdote or a, a small story why you become so passionate about open form. Maybe you can explain it. Yeah. So um, during my my praxis semester, I I was working in a company which um, were analyzing thermal electric generator modules. So it was like I think ten years ago there was like. Everyone was talking about 
heat recovering system in, in, in cars. And I, I had the, the task to verify that these thermoelectric generator modules um, have the correct efficiency. So the, the supplier told us, okay, they have seven to 8% efficiency. And I made a test bed to check if we can reach really this efficiency. However, my test bed was like heating plate, a couple block, and then the tech module, mm -hmm. couple block and a cooling plate. So I was measuring like the temperatures in these couple blocks were pure copper. And based on the temperature gradient, the thermal conductivity, I could calculate, you know, the thermal fluxes. And I had like this tech module, I had a power generator out there to check out what we can get out. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I was not able to meet these uh, efficiency numbers, the supplier told us. And there was a guy in the company, he just made open foam simulations. Um, so it was like when open foam 1.7 came out and the, the first conjugated heat transfer solar was out. So he was really, you know, he was trying something and uh, I cracked it and I made some simulation. So it, he, he really showed me what was wrong on my test bed. So like the fluxes were like compressing from this hot plate into my copper, um, yeah, guy. Mm -hmm. And this compressing of these fluxes lead to wrong temperature gradients. And then after this, after he gave us the presentation of his analysis, so we were thinking, okay, we have to change the way we are doing our measurements. And after that, yeah, we got really, very close to the, uh, the data the suppliers sent us. So, and then I, that was like the beginning that I was really, wow, this guy, he made like really, you know, w without him, I, I were never able to understand the physics behind that. So I, okay, I was young, I had, had two less experience, but on the other way, there are some physics around which you never can catch and this tool really get me to the point or, or the team and I th that fascinated it was so fascinating for me and that that was the start you know the first time I understood heard the tool open foam and it was for free and then you start okay downloading it and checking out what it is even though you have no idea about CFD and all this uh, related mathematics behind or whatever but this was like the story why I, the first contact was open phone. Mm -hmm. And yes, that's, and the fascination of these, yeah, numerical investigations. It's not only open phone, it's um, numerical investigation, I would say. Mm -hmm. This is awesome. So basically the fascination doesn't stop here. You are also involved in the community itself. So for a long time already, you started in the open phone and the CFD online forum if I remember exactly correctly. Right. Yes, uh, we also want to talk about this because a lot of people know you from there and uh, maybe you want to add your two cents here on why it is important to not only ask a question and on CFD Online, for example, or any other community, and which is driven by engaged people like yourself, but also, so not asking only questions, but also contributing to the community itself. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to talk about that a little bit. So um, as you said, yes, um, I, I started to, first I started to get a moderator on the German's Open Phone Forum. Mm -hmm. So some people know this guy, Thomas Tian, he was like, you know, he was a supervisor. Mm -hmm. When I started with Open Phone, he really gave me so much input. And I think after a year, he asked me if I want to join him as a moderator on the German CFT Forum. But as this is really, you know, there are only, I would say now after 10 years being a moderator there, um, you have two peaks in the year and it's always end of the year and in the mid of the year when the, the, the students have to do their bachelor or master thesis and they, they get lost. So especially German people or German students and they are asking only there because it's a German forum. Mm -hmm. uh, but then when the, the questions get more complex, I went to CFD online and started to ask there. And I think after two or three years, Bruno Santos, Wildcat, uh, he's an old guy, he asked me, so Toby, you reached some level on open foam. You are not asking too much anymore. You are supporting people. Um, 
what do you think about being a moderator and supporting me? And and then I started to to get a moderator on CFD online, so especially for the open forum forum stuff. I introduced, I think, two years ago this community subforum, community contribution subforum. I'm also planning to introduce a new subforum now for open foam models. Um, so it's like, you know, um, it's not there uh, till now, but uh, people are now aware that um, I'm planning to establish something like this. And it's important. So why it's important to ask uh, on the public forum? The main reason is because people, they always encounter the same problems. And if they are doing or asking these questions like a private message or by email, it's like, you know, the community get don't get the fruits out of that. So for me, it's important to have like, you know, a public, a public discussion that everybody can discuss with everybody and everybody can read the things people are writing there. Mm -hmm. Because me, I'm not always right. So I have like a background, but not on all topics. I think you you know that there are so many topics out yeah. there. And yeah, that's why for me, it's important to have the questions public and on the correct forum. So to the community, one thing, please, please, if you if you ask a question, check out, okay, I have this problem. Um, we have sub forums, an open forum, and then just locate where does it fit best. And yeah, then you have to think about if I ask a question, if another guy who is not involved in my problem, does he understand the question so that he can give me support? Because it's sometimes, you no know, people are just writing, I have an error or I have uh, the solver is breaking up and then you get like two lines or just a segmentation fall and it's not possible to give any help. And um, in priori, you always have to think about if I ask a question, I want to get something from the community, so I should also spend time in asking. And spending time in asking, I mean, checking the format, is the is my English well, Is, is yep. do I have enough um, information that the people can help me? So out of out of the box, I would say the first first posts I made on CFD online, they were <laughs> not not correct at all. So I made a lot of English mistakes, but um, when I came across these uh, messages or posts, I am going to, you know, edit them all, already or still now. Mm -hmm. So I try to keep uh, the, the posts and the quality of the posts, you know, yeah higher quality yeah that makes complete sense and it's funny that you say this because um on episode 33 of the podcast we had manuel brusche on who is the ceo and founder of timeula so we talked yeah. about time management and he was saying a nice thing about how to ask a question or giving orders like when you go to mcdonald's and you order how can you say the order like i want to have uh, for example french fries and i want to have a coke without the employee of mcdonald's asking you a question back so if you ask yeah, okay. a question, if you give an order so good or ask a question so good that nobody else can ask a question back, then you know that the question is good enough. And to be in exactly. the mindset, to be in the beginner mindset, um, like you were in the beginning, yes. for example, I think, yeah, that makes complete sense. And I hope that everybody who listens to this podcast now understands to ask the right questions. Um, um, of course, when we're beginners, we always make mistakes and we still do make mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's completely normal yes uh, I, I still do make mistakes too so i'm yeah. not perfect yeah. in any case yeah, yeah. but um, it, it will help the people to to understand the the problematics they are encountering and that the, the community is able to support them yes and it's, it's better than asking so can you please do this or do that and we have like sticky um threads on CFD online. So how do I ask a question, for yeah. example? Yes, and people can read this, but I know no one has time. No one takes time to read like these sticky threads. Um, yeah, it is like what it is. Yeah. yeah, so maybe we can, you could create something like a template, for example, a problem description or anything like that. And then people would actually know how to post because I know the problem from other forums where people ask something and we're like, okay, does he mean this or does he mean something else? But yeah, it's a bit difficult, yeah. especially so, when you have a big community. 
Exactly. Yeah, it's difficult, and I also using open foam, you know, it has so many tricks and and problematics that an error is not an error. It's not the same. And if you have another solver, you have, you know, if you, for example, if you don't use the debug version of open foam, the error message is sometimes really like you get an error, and that's it, um, without even this this crazy uh, C++ error message you you get out. Sometimes it's just segmentation form without anything. So if you have have the debug version of OpenFOAM, you don't get more information out of it. That's that's really tricky, yes. And especially for beginners who are not aware of C++, who are not aware of C CFD too much and numerics and all these things. They, yeah, I can, I remember myself, it was really, really crazy for me to get into OpenFOAM and even after a few years, I am still thinking I'm, I know nothing. Yeah, sometimes. So, and yeah, actually, I think this is also the reason why I'm I'm supporting the community so much because I know how hard it is to to get into the toolbox. And just one one sentence yeah. during my start, um, it was not. So today we have a lot of more material out there. You know, the Wikipedia invented, I think, by Joseph from uh, um, openform.com, mm -hmm. wiki wiki.openform.com has a lot of material out there. We have, uh, you know, my training videos, my training um, or open form tutorial special with in some special areas with a lot of comments inside with a new run script. Um, during my my time when I started with open form, there was nothing, you know, it was really, really hard to get um, very good information and support, except CFD online. There were the people always, but, you know, training videos, something like this, even Joseph with his YouTube channel, he supported so many people, even when I started. So I could learn a lot of from his uh, videos. Yeah. And uh, luckily we had Joseph in one of the <laughs> recent podcasts. And so it's funny that that I have you as well, because when I started uh, doing CFD in my master's as a specialization with turbulence modeling and also a bit CFD yes. on the side, when, you, when you're Googling in, in German communities, always the same name come up like Tobias Holzmann and Josef Nagy. <laughs> it's always the same. So I appreciate your work. And we also, this is very important, uh, Tobias, I want to talk about this, how much work you actually put into your videos and up updating them because new open form versions are coming up and how can this how can the community or people listening to this podcast support you okay so um i want to split this question because on the other side i make these youtube videos mm -hmm. and on the on the other hand or other side i make these uh, training tutorials on my website and, yeah. and sharing all my knowledge on my website so Let's say starting from from YouTube tutorials, I would say for 20 minutes, I need two three hours. Mm. Um, then it's it was a good one. <laughs> then I had a good start um, because sometimes it can happen that I make a, a training video 20 times, and if you yeah 20 minutes per video, sometimes I, I stop after eight eight minutes because. Yeah, you, you are a YouTuber too, so sometimes you really have to, okay, this was really terrible and sometimes I have problems with my sound and, and whatever. So it is actually a lot of time I'm spending just on making the video and then preparing the video is if another thing because audio um, preparation and converting audio, making it, giving it more volumes, you know, yeah. you, you have to really, if you want to make a good one, You, you have to really uh, put effort in that. And, and that's the, the reason why the old tutorials from 2015 are no longer on my YouTube channel because the audio was so crazy. You, you, you heard my washing machine. And you know, for me, it's not any more professional. Yeah. So maybe I make a remaster, but this is like, you know, I think for 20 minutes, I need five to six times longer if it's, it's, it was a, a good record. Sometimes 10 times, 15 times, depending on, on the topic and what I want to tell the people. On the other hand, as I said, my website is like a huge project, which, which takes a lot 
really a lot of, of time. I, I spent last year, for example, this website release I made, I spent time from August to until December to get everything work. And I worked um, really, I would say every day, two, three hours because I want to get rid of all these modules I was buying and, and had into my Joomla version. Um, even though I don't have to do that, but it was my passion and I wanted to, to give the community a better platform for distributing my, 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 yes, my, my training, training material. Um, however, this is just one thing. It's my website. Um, but the other thing is the tutorials itself. I have 32 tutorials right now on my website and you have each year a new open form version. You have to check every year are my uh, yeah tutorials still up to date. And this is also really time consuming. Even though I have automatic runtime, uh, run scripts, which, which makes a lot of work, but um, in general, you have to tweak these and these and these because mm -hmm. the classes changes, the keywords change, and you have to, if something like this happens, you should make sure, um, is the, the code still working as in the last um, version or not? So this makes really a, a lot of, of work. And, and then I have my book, which does also take a lot of work because um, I introduced like, you know, um, code, C++ code, which should be, you know, pushed to the actual version too. And it's really time consuming. I think for my book, I spent hundreds of hours. I would say 2000 hours during my PhD until I'm in this, yes, version now. So really a lot of work I spent there. Yeah, this is crazy that people, sometimes, not all of them, of course, only see the tip of the iceberg. They say, hey, Toby has a free version of the PDF. But actually, if they, if they can support you, um, because one guy, I was posting it on LinkedIn, actually, your PDF, your free PDF. Um, how does it work with payment, just to get it off the, out of the way? Maybe it's not an important topic, but just that people know how could they pay for the full PDF? So if you if you go to my full uh, to my website, there is like you can get the the full version. Um, you can pay with PayPal or okay. Claronet or wire transfer. So if you make wire transfer, you, it's your preferred um, thing. You should just contact me. But um, if you're interested and you you have no idea how to to get the book, just just get in contact with me. So I hope that it is clear enough on my website. And you know, it's just 9.99, so nine euros 99. It's not too much. I don't want to charge anyone. It's, it's for me, it's more like if someone is really um, interested in the book and he finds it helpful, it's like giving some, yeah, yeah some something back, some fruits in, in, in terms of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that yeah. makes absolute sense. And I think everybody who can support, I also said that as well. If you want to support, do it. If you can't, then don't do it. Just give the video a thumbs up or comment or anything like that just to show your yes. appreciation. Um, also, a lot of people are interested in who Tobias is as a person, of course, and uh, you did your PhD, you said. Can you maybe explain, yes. because the topic you um, investigated there was quite exotic, I would say. Can you explain for the people what was your PhD in and uh, what did you uh, actually investigate? Of course. So my PhD was about local heat treatment of aluminum alloys. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you are not a metallurgy guy or if you are not into that topic, so um, just for the, for the people out there, special aluminum alloys, they get heat treated to get better mechanical uh, properties such as the, the yield rings or something like this. So commonly what you do is um, when you make your casting, you have your aluminum part, you make, you put it into the oven mm -hmm. and you make a super saturated solid solution. That means that all um, atoms, so if you put like aluminum, then you have silicon, you have copper, you have magnesium, they get really spread it homogeneously in this um, material, the aluminum matrix, and then you quench it. So you, you keep these atoms at their position and then you make like an aging, it's called aging. It's nothing nothing more than you put the guy back into the oven, but on very low temperatures. And this is really, really um, energy consuming, you can imagine. And the question was, if we just, you have a screw somewhere 
and you want just to have like a local treatment that you change the aluminum properties only regional mm -hmm. um that was my topic um for example using a, a burner or a laser and what i did is actually i made with open foam um the thermal stress analysis so i had i created my own boundary condition for the laser so it's also in my repository somewhere mm -hmm. um really crazy code not very clean but in any case and then i used open foam for solid mechanics actually and it was very interesting but on the other hand you know using finite element methods or the finite element method for stress analysis comparing the stress analysis with finite volume it was really really crazy so there were it was two two topics using either this method or this method and after that yeah you know i was calculating the, the thermal stresses in my material and i had to prevent yielding so that the, that my part is not deforming and Knowing the temperature distribution, I also made a material kinetics. So I, I calculated what happened really in the in the material. And this was really a pain in the ass. I was struggling with this problem like one and a half years with my professor. We had so many ideas, but actually there were so many problems and it was so complex that we at the end, it was a very interesting solution I presented because I used open foam then. So what I made actually is um, I had my part in there. I had some probe points where I tracked the temperature. I calculated only on, let's say, 100 points the material change um, using the material kinetic calculation. And then I used open foam again for distributing these material points into the material using a Poisson equation. Now it was a Laplace equation. Mm -hmm. Yes, so it was very interesting. I was working with foam a lot and, you know, getting more into the details with foam. So that was what I really wanted to do. Besides, of course, there was the, was the material kinetics. I was not so interested in that, but um, at the end, I, I finished it. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. I mean, I mean, this was complex enough. I, I'm, I'm sure going into the material uh, properties or the oh, the yes. theory that was uh, another topic. Um, Josef, when he was on our podcast, he talked a little bit about the basics of uh, what to take care of when doing a simulation and so on. When we talked, yes. you said that you want to talk a little bit about the numerics. What important things you have to take care of because you also have your experience with the numerics. Yeah. Um, maybe you want to talk a little bit about it, not delve too much into the topic. No, 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 no. Uh, for, for the beginners, for example, when I started, I did, everybody starts like that. You, you check out the tutorials from OpenFoam, and what you do is you just copy paste the, the folder into your project folder, you change the mesh and you let it run. So the problem is that um, the OpenFoam tutorials mostly, they have uh, a pure hexadron mesh based on block mesh or something like this. So you don't have too much non-orthogonality problems. And based on that, the numerical schemes are set accordingly. So what I always do is for, for the gradient schemes, for example, I start always with upwind just to check if everything works. Mm -hmm. And very important is to make the explicit correction for the non-orthogonality so if you if your cells get like you know squeezed a bit and and the cell center to say sense cell center to cell center is not going to the face center anymore then you get this non-orthogonality and therefore you should change the laplace and the surface normal grading calculation scheme accordingly there's a very good description in the open form user guide and everybody who's interested in that should just read like this section of, of about numerics there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is it the only thing that uh, beginners have to take care of or what other advices would you give them? I want to advise you, you told me before we started the podcast last week, we had the, our meeting is read. Read is one of the things that you want to mention because sometimes I know it from myself, like when I was a student, there was an error on MATLAB and I thought, okay, maybe I ask someone else, but it's actually written in the like on the on the screen basically this is error in line so and so and then you can basically read and find the error yourself right so. exactly so 
there are a lot of material already out there um and that's why it's it's good to to read especially if you get an error on open foam so an error does not always mean i'm lost and it's just hieroglyphs or something i don't understand because sometimes there's one line or two lines which directly state what is wrong and then there is like a, a combination of something very strange like these c plus plus errors and if they are standing cannot find file in folder <laughs> so cannot find file t in folder zero then it's clear that you don't have the file t in the zero folder <laughs> mm. or um Sometimes there are keywords missing if you use boundary conditions or, for example, if you, if you use the linear upwind scheme in OpenFoam, then you have to specify the gradient of view at the end. So sometimes there you, you specify some keywords and there is something missing, but OpenFoam will actually give you um, something. Not always, but in the most, most times. And if you, if you never read these messages, you will never get you know familiar with this and then you always see error stupid open foam open foam can do nothing and it's terrible so my advice is also reading the error messages you get and besides of that reading the material we have already out there in the in the community mm -hmm. Um, I know that uh, you mentioned the wiki of OpenFoam, which is a good place to yeah. get started with. I mean, there's all of, lots of material from you and Joseph and other great guys which contributed to this. But I know that a lot of people will ask always about books. So what books yeah. would you recommend if someone gets started in OpenFoam? Uh, that's, that's a good question. You know, uh, OpenFoam is like a, a toolbox for, for analyzing computational fluid dynamic problems and also solid mechanic problems. Besides that, OpenFoam is a C++ toolbox. So, and, and you know, CFD is not just equations and you make colorful pictures. CFD is also like meshing. You have to know numerics. So in my personal opinion, it is good to know what is behind, because if you get errors somewhere, you have instabilities, your solvers blowing up, it is always very good to have like the background. And yeah sometimes it's really really tricky so no, no specific book recommendations then from your side or is it like it's basically a combination of meshing numerics and all, a lot of other things like in for example having the physical knowledge we talked about this why you are interested in open form right where you have the yeah. uh, the compressed gradient in the block this is basically physical understanding that you only get by experience so there is yeah. actually no book for experience but you could yeah You just have to do it, I guess, right? And learn from yeah. your mistakes. So um, based on OpenFoam, I cannot recommend books because OpenFoam is actually a C++ uh, toolbox. Mm -hmm. It's an extreme big suit. Um, I read a few C++ books so that I'm getting familiar with C++ in general. Mm -hmm. But if you want to go with OpenFoam, you have to know DoxyGen. DoxyGen yeah. is the source code documentation and Everybody who is wa wants everybody who wants to deal with OpenFoam in in terms of developing or understanding the the code inside has to be familiar with DoxyGen. Otherwise, there are so many functions, so many uh, possibilities, and these classes that you don't you get you get actually just lost. Hmm. Uh, on the other side, you can of course using a debugger, but um, DoxyGen is really thing you have to, to, to take into account there. Mm -hmm. On numerics, so I don't read too much books about numeric actually. On Therefore, I cannot give any recommendation. For CFD in general, um, I, I, my, my favorite book is from Fertziger in Paris, Numerical Simulations. Mm -hmm. And this was a book I, I bought almost, I think, at the beginning of, of, of starting with OpenFoam. And I still have it. And um, for me, it's a very good book. Um, there's also a, a very good book published by Mukalet et al. Two years ago, I think, which is called um, Finite. Uh, I don't know. 
a very good book about finite volume method, and they have a lot of pictures inside about mm. matrix construction and, and things like this. Very good. Um, and also old books, you know, uh, Wilcox or Bird et al. So I, I, during my during I wrote my book in uh, my my own book about uh, this numeric stuff and mathematics. I was reading the book of of Bird, Transport Phenomenon. Uh, very good book, very well written also. And you know there are so many good books out. Um, so it's always depending on the author, uh, how they write and, and how they express things. Actually, I read a lot of literature about CFD and they all, the, always the problem I had was they start with an equation and then they present the final equation. And I always wanted to know how they get to this equation. And that's why if you're really interested in something like this, you can get my free version of my book because I explained each each single step on a lot of equations. And I think this is unique. Um, maybe I had to do it myself, you know, because uh, I'm not a genius. Like I see this crazy equation and then two sentences after that, they have like a very short equation. And it's like, after you make some mathematic manipulations, you get to this equation. So mm -hmm. I really had to do all these single steps in order to understand what's going on there. Um, therefore, yeah, I can recommend my book <laughs> um, for, for these basic mathematic uh, expressions and equations. And of course, there are so many other books around. Um, yeah, I, I think I have, I have eight or nine CFD books. They all cook with water, so they yeah. all explain the thing in a different way. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need two or three books to understand what's going on. Because my problem was always CFD is not, you know, you start from from point here and you go here. CFD is like a bunch of topics you you have to think about when you are making simulations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes complete sense to be us. Um, when it comes to projects, how would you personally, as a beginner, when you look back now, how would you approach a project? Is it like, would you approach it like in the finite element method where you have this divide and conquer approach, where you say, I divide my problem into several parts. Let's say I have a CFD problem. I want to mesh this car, for example, which is super complicated. I take the mesh as a separate problem. I take the processing, the boundary conditions as a separate problem. And, then, and I take the interpretation of the um, images, so post-processing as a separate problem. Would you agree on that or would you do something else? I would, I would agree on that. So during my long time experience in, in, in CFD, especially with open foam, I, my, the main focus I have is always pre-processing. So mesh generation. Mm -hmm. And if you have a good mesh, you are, you're really happy afterwards. Um, so I split it commonly in meshing. And if the mesh is very good and I am satisfied with the mesh, I go on in making the boundaries. Um, Of course, if you if you have like 10 years experience, sometimes it's it's really easy to set the boundaries according to the problem. Um, but sometimes it's also, you know, you're struggling with the boundary conditions and you you really have to, I would agree to, to separate like your, your other problem with the boundaries here and then solving. But solving is not nothing more than if everything before was okay and, and good good handled, then afterwards solving is not a big deal. And post-processing. Post-processing is another big topic because finding the, the pictures or analyzing the flow with all these um, possibilities and filters we have, for example, in Paraview, um, it's not always easy to, to really, especially to show a, a customer um, what is the problem, how are the physics, because just Yeah, pictures, uh, colorful pictures, uh, they sometimes look good, but don't explain the problem. I encounter these problems too. So for me, it's always, you know, sometimes a bit difficult to distinguish what picture is good, what is not good, because I'm the guy who, who did the CFD simulation. For me, it's clear. I, I saw everything. So I have the 3D model. I saw all the, the pictures. But then you go to a customer and say, okay, hmm. We have here two, three pictures, and this should represent the problematic. So I agree totally, Joseph, to 
this splitting, meshing, boundary solving, post-processing, however you want to name it. Sometimes I even make it twice. So I make a very coarse mesh mm -hmm. that my run is very simple, that I don't have to wait for, let's say, a solution two days in order to find correct boundary conditions or something like this. And then you, if you get more advanced, yes, you, you can combine things with, with scripts or something like this. Or sometimes if you have two times the same case, you can investigate into that case, really boundary conditions and numerics and all this stuff. And then if something like this happens, you have the same case with another geometry, okay, you can copy paste this and you have just to focus on, on the meshing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, do you, do you think uh, building something from scratch, this is how I learned OpenForm, like the basics of OpenForm, where I had block mesh and I built everything by writing down the points and then connecting them and then you had a block mesh at the end. Do you think it makes sense as a beginner? Um, well, starting with block mesh, I think it's not necessary. <laughs> okay. um, block mesh is, is good to if you want to really understand a bit more because you also have to to get the correct orientations of the block yes. and how the, the orientation of the mesh that the, the surface normal is always pointing outwards the cell. You, you get a, a feeling about that when, when you use uh, block mesh, but I think it's not ne necessary to, to use block mesh at the beginning. Um, and and <laughs> you, you know it too. So I started also with block mesh. And if you have 10 blocks or something like that, um, it's getting really crazy. You're putting all these points. So what I made, I, I made a piece of paper. Yes. <laughs> and I, I, I put the points there and I wrote the coordinates and then I put it back into the block mesh stick. So it was sometimes really a pain in the air. Yeah, that's what I also did. This is super annoying. Like I was sitting there like for one hour and then the orientation was wrong. And then I, you can look in power view how the block mesh looks like. And then yes. it looked, it was completely distorted. And I was like, ah, oh, not again. And then you have to go start from scratch. It was. Yeah. Yes, and you, you're thinking, which which face is it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. Really but you would would you would you uh, recommend starting with maybe Snappy Hex Mesh because there is a big documentation around Snappy Hex Mesh and it's may, way more convenient. As, so, and from 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 my case, so I'm always using a Snappy Hex Mesh still now. Um, it has a huge, um, yeah. Let's say it in other words. So you can use Snappy Hex Mesh very, very easily. So when you look at my tutorials, I explain it really in, in more detail, but actually you put in your STL file, you define your patch names and you say you want to refine it there, just give it a shot. Mm -hmm. And so probably in most cases it runs if you have a, a good STL file or good preparation. And if you are going on Snappy Hex Mesh, allows you to manipulate your mesh in, in a variety of different methods. So surface refinement, region refinement, edge refinement, you can introduce whatever you want. Yes. So Snappy X Mesh is really powerful, in my opinion. The only thing is that the layer generation, the algorithm is not the best one because you, you put your layers on top. So if this is surface, this is the internal mesh here, you put the layers on top, so outside, and then you push it inside. So the internal mesh gets distorted and squeezed. And that's the reason why um, the layer generation is, is really a, a problematic thing here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you, we talked about uh, some exotic topics today, um, Tobias, and there's one project you're working on with CFD at the moment, which is you're building a 3D printer from scratch. Is it correct? No, no. Okay. No, I'm oh, sorry. I have, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So what I have, I, I last year I bought like a 3D printer. Yes. And actually, I don't want to make advertisement here. <laughs> um, uh, it's an Ender's 3 version 2. You, uh, the, the printer is very silent. But I was, you know, as a fluid mechanic guy, I was checking out um, the, the cooling devices. Mm -hmm. is, is just like there. And the fans are for me too loud. Yes. And, and that's why I removed these two, I removed these two fans and via this 3D printer, I printed a comp complete new airflow channel and I have a new fan, which is 120 millimeters, not these 60 millimeters. And 
I'm going to investigate into this, I think, tomorrow yeah, via open phone because I, I created everything now. I created um, the, the channel. It's already printed. Um, by the way, um, for the, the people who are who are looking at, at this video, this guy, it is it is about this guy. Wow. Like, it was an interesting project for 3D printing because it was the first time. And of course, um, to satisfy everything, I have to make a CFD analysis to make sure that the things work out correctly. Yeah, this is so cool. Uh, will you will you publish the series as a separate video on your channel? How you did it? And yes. So? Nice. I, I will. I think um, I will make a, a blog post on my website. But I, I think I will also make like a, a few videos about this project and about 3D printing and generating this guy and also about the CFD analysis. This is great. You were saying you were making a blog post and when you said blog, I was afraid that you say block mesh. I was like, no, he's not saying block mesh. But no, no. blog post. <laughs> post. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so also what we want to talk about, there were a lot of questions regarding machine learning for CFD, but I, I guess this is like a very big topic. And if anyone listens to this, I have some uh, podcasts lined up for this. So when it comes to physics informed neural networks, etc. So we don't want to annoy you, Tobias, with this ever coming yeah. question. It's coming all the time. <laughs> my, I swear my LinkedIn feed or my, my messages is full of, hey, what can I do to combine CFD with machine learning? I'm like, just wait, I have podcasts aligned. But so we're not going to annoy you with that. So if anyone listens to this podcast now with Tobias, uh, just wait a bit. It will be published soon. Um, to wrap things up, I have prepared 10 questions for you, Tobias, which I call the question rampage. So random yeah, funny okay. questions for Tobias. Um, any last advices you would give maybe to your 18-year-old self, 18-year-old uh, Tobias? What would you say? What I would say to my 18-year-old guy, yeah. um, an advice, and this advice was from a colleague from Leoben, and it really, for, for myself, it, it, it fits the truth. And I would tell myself, Toby, just keep in mind, if you gain something, you lose something. And uh, actually, for, for myself, this is like a, a statement that, that holds for me. And do what you like to do. This is awesome. Yeah, cool. Yes. I like it, Tobias. So are you ready for the 10 questions I prepared? I, um, I think uh, no one can, can be prepared for that. Yeah, that, that's correct. This is like a, it was like a standard question. <laughs> anyway, let's start with, uh, with question number one, which is uh, what are you most proud of? Most proud of my daughter. Nice. I love it. Question number two, um, simulation you are most proud of? Um, the GeForce NVIDIA investigation I made last year. This was good, yeah. I have to check, Did you have? A, do we have a video on your channel? Of I have whole? a video on that. I have to of check the, it out. Of the, of the, just, just the simulation. So I'm just proud of that because I, you know, I, I disassembled the, the card and I made everything by myself. So. It's, it's a nice thing, yes. Yeah, and uh, also before we jump to the next question, uh, because I'm too interested in this, NVIDIA didn't get back to you, right? Um, when it oh, no, no, no one get back to me. Yeah, Even was... Asus, uh, I, I asked them. So actually it's Asus card, so not NVIDIA, ah, okay, NVIDIA. But, but Asus Asus was not uh, interested in that. Mm -hmm. Of course it was an old card, 1070, but in any case. Yeah. Um, it... Just, just one, one, one quick remark because um, these the, the fans of these graphic cards. I'm always impressed because when when they are really, sp if your graphic card is on 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 full load and they are spinning extremely fast, if you always, if I put my hand underneath these fans, I have the feeling they are not pushing the, the air in. They get like, you know, pushing the the air out. So. Vice versa. And of course, this is based on too much back pressure, and that that's why I, I'm not. I I don't know why they have this one millimeter distance between these fins. I don't know. Maybe someone introduced this somewhere, and it's like you know common practice to do that. Um, but maybe it would be better to to make these fins distance two millimeters that the the airflow can go through better to get less. 
back pressure. I don't know. You have to investigate into that. I, I was just thinking about that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I did a, a webinar at Electronic School Link. Maybe you remember that, uh, where it exactly goes to this point. And actually, NVIDIA has um, a whole neural network framework. It's I'm not sure how it's called. I forgot the name. Uh, Simnet. It's called Simnet. And they did exactly okay. this. They trained a the neural network and changed the form of the pins. And after mm -hmm. a lot of hours of training, they had the optimal pin form so that the flow could flow through. I can send you the link and maybe put it in the description for everyone interested. You can actually see how the pins transform and that how the flow uh, behaves better. Anyway. Ah, okay. This yeah. is awesome. I have to send it to you. I send it to you already yeah. after the podcast. Um, right. Question number three. You win $1 million. What do you do first? Um, $1 million. I would just su support open foam. I would just donate, I, I think, 100,000. Just because... You know, it's open source and it is a, a crazy toolbox. It's free for everybody. And in my opinion, each company who is using that should, should just give a little bit of, of, of give something back. Yeah. Yeah. Makes so this would, sense. First, this would be the first um, I would do. Awesome. I love it. Question number four. If you could spend one day with a celebrity, who would it be? <laughs> Can be dead or alive. Doesn't matter. <laughs> yes, Zach. Yes, sir. You have Earth, to explain. Yes, you have to explain who it is. Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> Herf, yes, sir. He is the guy who introduced Open Foam with Henry Weller. He's the guy from where? Where is he from? From, come on. Um, he is he is the guru in Open Foam. Um, he, I swear, I forgot his name. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. His his PhD thesis is you know the basic of Open Foam. I swear, Earth, yes, I, heard, I heard this name, you said Yasak, I was like, I know this name somewhere, but I had to ask, <laughs> I wasn't sure. But yeah, yes. um, cool. It would be, it, it is this extreme tall guy, you know? <laughs> Did and, you meet him um, in person? No, unfortunately not. Okay. I met the guys from Open Foam Foundation, Henry Weller and uh, his team, but Yasak, not now. Okay. okay. Yeah. Now I know who Yasak is, thanks to me. Um, yes. Next question, a uh, video from your channel you enjoyed filming the most. Was it the graphics card video? I, I mean, it's not filming, um, it's more like editing, right? Um, no, um, it's the upcoming video I, <laughs> I'm going to do. Okay. So it's, um, yes, the, because uh, I made a Blender sing yesterday and I want to include something new within my videos. And I think the next video I make is the one I really enjoy most awesome yeah we're looking forward to that um yes. favorite programming language uh, c plus plus obviously <laughs> yes Fav because yeah. yeah yeah it's obvious favorite movie um no no movie um quentin tarantino movies okay yeah that's good love it uh, favorite youtuber Favorite, favorite YouTuber? That's a good question, man. Um, I like uh, Joseph Nagy's YouTube uh, channel. I, 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 yeah, I would have told that you would say this. Yes. Um, next question. One superpower you would like to have? Superpower? I'm, I don't want to have a superpower because uh, then things get not as interested as they are right now. Yeah. And if, if I had one... I, <laughs> sorry, I was not prepared for this question. Superpower. Yes, um, yes. Now I have one. Um, doubling my myself so that I have three or four Tobys working on different projects and supporting the people. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, this is good. Yeah, I never had that answer so far in the podcast. This is a good one. Yes, yeah, good. Uh, there's too much to do actually. Yes. Yeah. If you were a superhero, what would your name be? <laughs> Shorty. Shorty. <laughs> Shorty. Yes, this is this is my nickname. All my friends name me Shorty. Shorty. Where does it come from? Is it like because you're not that tall, or? <laughs> no, it has a funny story. I was skating once when I was young, was fourteen, and um, everybody uh, on my neighborhood had a, a nickname, or just I don't had one. Everybody was telling me Toby, and then I was making a jump over two decks, and it failed. And then there was like the deck 
vice versa on myself and you know there's a brand name called shorties ah, and then a okay. guy said, hey we name you shorty now <laughs> okay got it got it yeah these were the 10 questions uh toby i appreciate you answering them all all of them uh, very interesting answers mm. is there anything else you would like to tell the audience before we wrap things up actually i think um we discussed our, a, lot of a lot of things yes i think they have to recover first Yeah, that's right. And maybe if the audience wants and have specific questions for open form, anything like that, maybe we can have a second part. Uh, I have a series in mind, which I will maybe launch, not a podcast, maybe another series, yep. um, where you could, yeah, maybe, I keep this secret now, maybe we announce it at some point. <laughs> Let's see. And So uh, maybe if there there are a lot of questions below these videos, we can we can answer them yes. in another, um, yes, interview or whatever yeah so makes sense yeah. so, so just just leave your comment below now exactly. and make yeah, yeah. Yeah. Your advertisement. <laughs> yeah but uh, also i have to make another advertisement so anyone listening to this make sure to subscribe to toby's channel because he's he's having awesome content and if you want Thank to support you. toby um and are not connected with me on linkedin yet or toby make sure to check out his homepage. i will also put a link to the pdf which you can purchase down in the description so with that being said, Toby, I really much appreciate your time. And finally, we had the time to get you in front of a camera. So I really much appreciate that because for some people it's not easy. So uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, with that being said, I wish you a nice weekend and we'll see each other on LinkedIn, I guess. Yes, yourself. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure for me to be on your show. And I hope that the community out there and, and your followers enjoy what I was uh, talking about. I hope everything was clear and I wish you all a good, good weekend. Keep healthy, guys. Awesome. See ya. Yeah.